All right, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, my name is James Condon, and I'm head of security and research at Lacework. And today I'm going to be presenting The Usual Suspects, a look at threat actors targeting the cloud in their battle for superiority. So today we're going to be talking about some of the threat actor groups that are behind some of the massive crypto jacking campaigns that are targeting your cloud resources. We'll talk about some of the characteristics of the pro prolific ones, go over some of their tactics, and then talk about some of the different ways that these guys actually end up targeting each other. So our story here begins with a simple honeypot. Earlier in my career, I spent a lot of time investigating uh, APT actors in the enterprise networks. And then over time, um, you know, I started to learn quite a bit about their tactics and techniques. And about two years ago, I started uh, researching more about cloud uh, security. And I really wanted to get an idea of what that threat landscape looked like. And there's a couple different ways to start. One of uh, the easiest ways is to see what prior reporting's been out. Um, and then a hands-on way is to really start deploying some vulnerable systems that you can get some live attack data on. So did a little bit of research, found that you know Redis was something that was being popularly attacked. Uh, it's very easy to leave unsecure. So started to set up a few different Redis honeypots. Really early on, started to see a lot of attacks against those things like trying to write an SSH key to the server or trying to write cron jobs, uh, those type of things. But eventually started to see some successful remote code ex execution exploits. And what those would do is do a wget or a curl command to download a bash script, and then that bash script would start downloading additional pieces of malware. So as I'd monitor these servers as they would get compromised, I noticed that we'd start seeing the number of cron job entries going up we'd start seeing tons of different processes. And eventually, these servers would start to crash because there was so much activity. So I decided to take a closer look and do some forensics on the malware and scripts that we're seeing on the box. One of the things that really stuck out right, right away with uh, starting to look at some of these scripts is you know, how aggressive they were. You'd start seeing these long laundry lists of different commands to either remove or kill processes. And they would grow and grow. And what you would kind of see over time is a new process would start. And then um, after that process was started, it would immediately get killed by something else. Or um, you know things would just kind of get completely out of hand. So what I wanted to do is really get an idea of, OK, so we have multiple different actors targeting uh, you know, these servers. And they clearly know about each other. Um, you know, what are some of the characteristics of them? And more importantly, and more interestingly, I really wanted to know is, you know, how do they attack each other? There's a lot of different ways to kind of defend a vulnerable server that you've taken over. But what are some of the best ways? Which ways are brittle? And how do they ultimately protect, you know, these resources and compute that they've worked to uh, secure? So that's what this talk is going to be about. Um, we're going to highlight a few of the most prolific groups, and then we're going to highlight some of those tactics that they use, and then uh, leave you here with uh, some interesting things to start looking for in your own environments. So I'm going to release uh, these slides on our blog following the talk. And what you'll see is you'll see a number of footnotes on these different slides, and they point to various articles. So this is really a collection of research from in-house research and a lot of great stuff put out uh, by a lot of the other security community. So the focus here is when we think about threat actors, there's really, um, there's a lot of different groups out there and we can kind of bucket them into um, major types of activity based on you know, who their victims are and what they're ultimately after. So, for example, APT actors, you know, generally are carrying out nation state objectives and they're looking for economic espionage, intellectual property theft. But for, for, for the purpose of this, we're looking at criminal actors who are looking to gain money and those actors that are specifically targeting, you know, public cloud resources. So over the last two years, um, here's a number of different characteristics that we've seen in common with these different groups. First and foremost, uh, one of the most primary methods uh, that they use to 
um, gain money is through Monero mining. Uh, we don't see a lot of other different coins. We don't really see, you know, Bitcoin. Sometimes we'll see some random ones, but this is primarily Monero mi mining and occasionally some ransomware. A lot of these attacks kind of look uh, pretty similar in how they start out. Essentially, start targeting and scanning for vulnerable applications and servers. So these are any applications that are going to be attached to the internet that might have a way to either break in through uh, credential stuffing or brute forcing passwords, or they might be things that need to be patched and you know have some sort of remote code uh, execution vulnerability. Once the attackers have um, got initial access to a server, uh, they generally follow a number of different steps. These steps typically start off with downloading uh, a bash script on our Linux servers. And these scripts typically look for ways to kill other competing miners. Um, sometimes it's disabling security tools. Other times it's checking that, you know, if there's any controls around uh, CPU utilization, that those get disabled. Following this, we see downloading other types of installer, uh, downloading other types of malware. Uh, this could be, you know, modules for crypto mining. This could be uh, root kits, uh, all kinds of different things. And then ultimately establishing persistence. So persistence on the Linux host is typically done through either cron jobs or sometimes uh, system D services, uh, depending on the type of malware. So one of the first groups that I'm going to talk about is 82 Mining Group. Um, Talos did a lot of the initial reporting on this group, and uh, they're believed to be a Chinese-speaking threat actor, also going by the name 8220 uh, Gang. Been active since at least 2017. Uh, their targets are things that you'd probably imagine, um, things that would be likely misconfigured, internet-facing, unpatched, things like Drupal, Apache, Redis, um, you know, JBoss, Jenkins. One of the things that's pretty interesting with this group is seeing a lot of targeting of Docker and also Kubernetes. Um, there is different, definitely other groups that are targeting these platforms, but we see this, this seems to be a little bit more common uh, with the 8220 mining group. As far as tools that they use, uh, seeing shell scripts, uh, malicious containers uh, in a lot of different forms, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Uh, Elf malware. Um, they and a lot of other groups tend to use this tool called Lib Process Hider. Lib Process Hider is a way to disguise your running processes and hide it from things like PS commands and uh, top and H top. And this is basically achieves rootkit functionality without a kernel module, so it's very popular among uh, a lot of current uh, ELF binaries. Um, XMRig is a very popular, uh, publicly available, legitimate piece of Monero uh, mining software. Typically see this group hosting things on Pastebin and GitHub, so this might be where shell scripts or other malware is stored. One of the things that's, that's actually pretty common with these guys is that uh, they use TCP port 8220 uh, for their network C2s. And that's kind of what really stands out and got their them their name. On the host, when they have large malware campaigns, sometimes we'll see similar naming uh, for the different pieces of malware. So for example, Sapoi and Sustis are two different types of uh, malware names that they've used quite a bit. Additionally, you'll see this logo start JPEG format, and a lot of different groups have kind of used the same thing. So when you're investigating these intrusions, you might think that a lot of this looks like it's coming from the same actor, when in fact, there's just a lot of kind of commonalities and overlaps. The most interesting thing about this group is that they're believed to be the owner of the WhatMiner uh, GitHub repo, and this contains a lot of different illicit coin mining tools. So here's actually a screenshot of it. And you'll see those directories up top. Uh, we see this K worker D and Sustis uh, names that we saw on the previous slide. So it's kind of interesting if you look at the translated version of this, because uh, there's a number of statements, you know, saying that this is for legitimate purposes. For example, we see this organize and collect all kinds of malicious mining samples encountered for research and study. And then a little bit later, we see more of this emphasis on for study study only. 
And in case you're really curious and you notice that there's a license in here, that's actually the MIT license. One of the research projects that we did in um, early 2019 was looking for attacks against Kubernetes clusters. And one of the things that we saw is if we left the APIs uh, unsecured, that we would get uh, these attacks come in where the attacker would uh, basically set up a daemon set. And um, this would be a collection of five different containers using a vanilla CentOS image. And this CentOS image would have would be initialized with these commands that you see here, which is basically curling down XM rig and a configuration and running it. Now, if we take a closer look at this, we'll see that 8220, uh, that, C, that um, networks TTP uh, associated with the group, and also the Sapoi uh, naming scheme. So pretty high confidence that this is part of that 8220 mining gang. If you've had any sort of crypto jacking issues in your own cloud infrastructure, uh, there's a really good chance it might be from this group, Rock. Um, I don't have any awesome, cool logos for it, so I decided to go with this picture, this older picture of the rock, and so maybe we can get that one to stick for these guys. This is a Chinese-speaking threat actor uh, as well. Uh, a lot of different group names. Um, Unit 42 and Talos were doing a lot of the initial reporting on these guys and um, initially tracking as a couple different groups. They've been active since about 2018, a little bit later than 8220. Very similar targets to the 8220 mining group, but there's a lot more breadth here. So for example, what we're seeing is targeting of Windows, targeting of Android, uh, Chrome. And then we saw a pretty massive Confluence uh, campaign in April of 2019. These tools and methods, again, pretty similar to what we saw with 8220, um, but with a little bit more breadth here. And some of the things that stick out on this are the use of things like JavaScript backdoors, uh, seeing PE binaries for Windows, um, also seeing malware coded in Python and Golang, also this use of the lib process hider. On the host, um, during some of these different campaigns, one of the things that we would see is um, uh, the the file naming schemes of Java and Kerberides. So if you've seen something like temp slash, or slash temp Java, uh, there's a good chance that that's a piece of rock malware in there. On the network side, see a lot of different evolution of their TTPs. So these guys started off with some basic, um, you know, putting shell scripts on Pastebin and then moving to their own infrastructure. And then Anomaly has recently reported them using DNS text records for C2. So seeing kind of an advancement there over time. I think the most interesting thing about this group is they're reported to have forked that what miner repo from A220 mining group and initially just basically replaced it with their own infrastructure and configuration. Another interesting thing that these guys have done is uh, they uninstall certain cloud security tools, especially from Alibaba and Tennyson. And they don't just kill the processes on these, they'll actually download uh, the clean uninstall scripts and run it that way. Also, I found it was interesting that they try and delete this uh, Etsy slash ld.so.preload. Uh, this would negate if another actor is using that lib process hider. Um, this would remove those, those shared libraries that they may have put in to disguise their processes. And the original name comes from this minor gate uh, wallet and login. The last group I want to mention is Pacha Group. Uh, so Inazur has done a lot of great reporting on this group. Um, this is another suspected Chinese-speaking threat actor. Um, a lot of similar targets as, as the other groups. Similar tools and methods. Uh, we see shell scripts, self binaries, uh, lib process hider. Um, here are the name of some of the malware, the AV names for the malware samples associated with them. But one of the things that really sticks out about this group is they really use a lot of advanced anti-analysis evasion persistent deployment techniques. For example, you know, we're not seeing simple bash scripts here. Um, a lot of the killing competitors is done uh, in the malware itself. We see some heavy targeting from them against Rock, but we also see them adopting some of Rock's tactics like disabling those exact same security products. 
Um, some of the, one of the other interesting things I want to highlight is they've also been reported to search out for web shells that might be on a server that they compromise, uh, linked to JBoss compromises. So this is kind of above and beyond um, what some of the other groups will search for when they're compelling when they're killing their competitors. This is just a simple screenshot uh, from Inizer. And here we can see that they're looking for these file names, Kerberods, which we mentioned earlier were associated with Rock, in particular uh, Confluence campaigns in 2019. So uh, today we're releasing a report on uh, Bash malware. So. I mentioned earlier in this talk that a lot of times the first stage after the exploit is using some sort of bash script to go ahead and uh, kill competitors and set up persistence and uh, in some cases try and propagate. So we did an analysis of a lot of different um, uh, bash malware samples that are associated with crypto jacking campaigns. And within that, you know, we report on commonalities of how these guys like to, um, you know, attack other processes. So, for example, one of the most common ways to do this is process killing using pkill, pgrep, psox, or psaux, and then grepping uh, for certain keywords and then killing the process that way. Now, um, one of the things that you might see in your own, like if you if you come across any sort of malware like this, is that sometimes you'll see IP addresses. Uh, these are typically looking for IP addresses that may have been put into the command line for different pieces of malware that are running. Um, other times, what you'll see is these kind of nonsensical process names. Uh, I think a lot of cases, this is an instance of you have uh, another malware family and when it downloads new modules, what it will go and do is give that, you know, a random file name. Sometimes they're not in completely random, so they might be giving uh, that same file name over and over. So if you see anything like this, it's likely looking for any sort of mal file names that they had picked up through their own research. Another thing that you'll see is this network connection killing. Um, and this is a, a sample from, I believe, a, a script that we found associated with the Rock and um, their, their confluence attacks. And all this is is netstat uh, grepping for different IP addresses and then finding those process IDs and going through and killing them. If we look at the different IP addresses found within this, we see one is a public Monero mining pool. We see another is a custom pool or proxy associated with the 8220 mining group. We see a C2 um, that's been associated with the SUSIS malware, which is 8220. And then we see Docker and Kubernetes uh, C2s that have been linked to 8220 as well. So this is just an example of, of how these different groups will you know, target the, the others. Some other methods of uh, thwarting network connections, just a simple, you know, using IP tables um, to go ahead and block IPs. Another one is sinkholing domains. So basically putting 0.0.0, .0, .0 um, as an entry for a given domain name uh, in the Etsy host file. In this example, we see this is a very uh, popular older uh, rock C2. Um, one of the things that is a shortcoming of this method is that we will, um, most of the times these guys will use IP addresses for custom mining pools and, and C2s as opposed to domains. So uh, sometimes this is a little bit hit and miss. Another tactic that we see is Docker image removal. So just listing out all the Docker images on a host and then go ahead and remove those um, within here. This is actually uh, XMRig disguised as Nginx. This was described by Unit 42's uh, Graboid malware. So we see this, you know, targeting and usage of uh, um, containers and in, in, in other cases, Kubernetes like earlier. So I encourage you to go and check out this report. There's a lot of different IOCs, YAR rules, and we dive deeper into some of these malware families. Uh, one of the interesting things is we look at which 
uh, commands are most common that are being seen uh, within these scripts. Uh, for example, uh, the two most common ones that we saw is trying to remove temp slash temp slash Java, which is the rock malware we mentioned earlier, and also looking to kill processes uh, with the name Sustis, which is 8220. So pretty fascinating stuff. Be sure to check that out. Like I said, we have a bunch of resources that you can learn more about this. And then now I'll take any questions and you can see a uh, feedback link for um, this talk as well as the research paper I mentioned. Sorry, uh, thanks James. Um, Question is, uh, what have you seen in terms of lateral movement? Anything around IAM privileges, scanning within the VPC, or evidence of container escapes, something like that, lateral movement me me mechanisms? Yeah, so, yeah, so typically with, um, sorry, I'm getting a little feedback. Um, when it comes to lateral movement with a lot of these crypto jacking campaigns, usually they're kind of cloud agnostic. So what we see is one of the most common ones is searching for uh, any known hosts that have been connected to via SSH and then seeing if they can connect out if they have keys from that server. So that's probably one of the most popular. And then the other is iterating for different applications that they have exploits that they can throw at and then sometimes uh, brute forcing as well. Makes sense. Um, Brennan asks, what's the life expectancy of boxes after they get compromised? Yeah, so it really depends. Some of the, like when we put up a small honeypot, like, you know, like a micro server, it's only going to last maybe a week or so. It's going to get compromised pretty quick. And then at some point, it's just not going to be able to handle it. So really kind of depends on the size. But sometimes some of these groups that get a good foothold and can kind of also throttle their own CPU usage, like they won't allow themselves to take over, you know, more than 30% as an evasion technique. Um, they can persist for a really long time. Uh, and then uh, a question about like defenses. So what have you seen be effective at preventing these kinds of attacks? Like the guard duty crypto mining alert, is that mm -hmm. reliable in, in finding these things? Um, yeah, so nowadays um, it's, getting, it's getting a lot easier to um, be able to kind of detect these things. But usually the hard part is um, you know, it's like the billing department that detects it because, you know, the bill's gone up quite a, quite a bit. Um, as far as preventing it, one is you can do research in finding some of these shell scripts to get threat intelligence on, on what these guys are doing. But usually a lot of this defense is making sure, you know, you're not using username password authentication for SSH, that you're using key base SSH, that you are, you know, patching. Sometimes it's hard, like with Confluence, there's a bad remote code execution that came out and then POCs uh, exploiting it a week later and then, you know, people just couldn't keep up. So, um, you know, again, it goes back to that that patching standpoint. Uh, and then one more question on the economics of this. So just wondering if you have any sense of why XMR is the currency of choice or whether any of the recent fluctuation in mining and currency prices has uh, had any measurable impact on, on what you're seeing in, in these attack vectors. Yeah. Um, so a lot of this is just kind of my opinion. One of the things I think Monero is used for the most is, um, you know, relative to other currencies, you know, it's, it's easy to use. Um, and it gives you a sense of you can remain anonymous by doing it. Like it's a lot harder to remain anonymous using Bitcoin. Um, Monero didn't really kind of pick up with these cybercrime groups until about two years ago. There was more attacks leaning towards ransomware. So it really basically shows me economically that this is where they're being able to make their most money. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, we'll be back in about, I encourage everyone to leave feedback, and we'll be back in about five minutes with Keston uh, speaking about uh, World Trust. So thank you very much, James. Awesome. Thanks for having me.